Hi, this is Jeff Price. I'm the CTO of GridSmart Technologies. I appreciate you taking the time today to learn some more about GridSmart. I want to talk a bit about the idea of permanent data collection with GridSmart. What I want you to consider is the kind of questions you can ask and answer when you actually have data for every hour of every day over months and years. Well, let's think about some of those questions. You can ask, how has traffic changed year over year? Maybe you're curious about your morning rush hour. Is it from work or school or both? Maybe that affects how you want to manage construction. Maybe you've changed uh, your main line to allow permissive lefts and you're, you're curious as to how that's affected performance. What is the overall peak hour on average looking at an entire year's worth of data? Maybe you want to know what the highest volume days of the year are. Maybe these aren't what you expect. Maybe your city's done a downtown revitalization and you're curious as to how that's affected traffic. These are the kind of questions you can answer with permanent data collection that you just can't answer with temporary studies. And this is the power of GridSmart and for the same cost as actuation. So when you consider the number of stakeholders, the number of people that, that need this data uh, and the need for efficient use of resources, it just makes sense. So the rest of my presentation uh, is actually split up into three parts, and I'm going to be jumping between slides and interactive demos quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about client, cloud, and data, how those play together. I want to discuss the GridSmart API, and I want to discuss some upcoming features uh, with cloud reporting. So let's get started with client, cloud, and data. So GridSmart 6.6 came out last month in early May, and hopefully you've all had a chance to download and use it. When you launched the GridSmart 6.6 client, you probably noticed uh, this new GridSmart Cloud dialog, where we try to give you some information about all the things that uh, GridSmart Cloud provides uh, if you connect the client to it. In particular, what I want to point out is that it says you can download data directly in the client for performance-enabled sites that have pushed data to cloud. And you can do this without having to visit the site or connect to it directly. This has in fact been the case since 6.3 came out uh, last June in 2016. So how does that data get pushed to GridSmart Cloud? Well, as you probably know, all GS2s now include a cellular modem, and they ship with a multi-purpose antenna to enable secure communications to GridSmart Cloud. It's also worth noting, by the way, that that multipurpose antenna will set you up nicely for future needs, such as travel time and origin destination via Wi-Fi capture, as well as uh, other connected vehicle applications. So if you've interacted with the GridSmart 6, 6 processor, uh, you may have also noticed uh, some new options in the network settings. In particular, we've now made the client capable of setting up uh, your processor on your city intranet. Uh, directly in the client. One of the things you'll be looking for uh, to make sure that the processor can talk to GridSmart Cloud so that we get this permanent data collection as we're talking about is this little check mark next to the GridSmart API. Um, so these network settings are explained and it notes in there that GridSmart when it can talk to api.gridsmart.com pushes all configuration and performance data to GridSmart Cloud so it's safely securely backed up readily available for reporting, and this is permanent. So what do I mean by permanent? Well, the last five years will be readily accessible and will provide older data through a procedure to be determined. Now to make sure you have access to this cloud data in the client, you're going to want to make sure you connect your GridSmart client to your GridSmart cloud account, and what you're going to be looking for is that the uh, cloud icon has this check mark in it. All right, with that in mind, let's, uh, let's jump to a quick demo of how this works. So I'm going to switch to the GridSmart client, and I'm going to go to an intersection. And what I want you to notice is that this intersection I'm not connected to. It's not on my network. I don't have a way to reach it. Uh, it is performance enabled. I'll jump into this intersection, and since it's performance enabled, I have the reports option. I click on the reports option. Um, I've downloaded a day of data, um, but I can also click on the download button. And what I'm seeing here is all the data that's available in GridSmart Cloud. I can actually download that, even though I don't have a connection uh, to this intersection. 
So, you know, let's download uh, yesterday's data, Wednesday the 7th. Download this data now. It may take a moment. Okay. Let's uh, set up a turning movement count report by hour by approach for the full day and generate that report. And reports works just like you'd expect with data that came uh, directly from GridSmart Cloud. So here we have a nice turning movement count report. So that was a brief demo of how the GridSmart client interacts with GridSmart Cloud to download data and allow you to do reports. So let's switch gears a little bit now. And I jump back out of the client. And let's talk a little bit about the GridSmart API. So what is the GridSmart API? Well, API stands for Application Programming Interface, and the GridSmart API is really a simple and open way to get data and images from a GridSmart processor. And what I mean by open is it's documented. So how do I use it? Well, we're going to go into this in a little bit more detail, um, but take note of these URLs. The API is documented at the user guide, and we also have made uh, some open source code uh, available to the public so that you can download this and interact with the API and, and learn to do things that maybe we haven't done yet. So again, I'm going to jump out of this and uh, jump into kind of a demo. So let's look at the GridSmart API documentation. As I mentioned, uh, it's on the web. It talks about what the API is and how to use it. What you'll see here uh, in the API documentation is all a quick reference for all the different API calls you can use. Uh, one that's perhaps most interesting if you're trying to do a permanent count archiving on your own is counts by date. Um, you can grab count data directly from the processor and, and put it into whatever kind of system you'd like to. Now, how are you going to interact with the API? As I said, it's an application programming interface, so it requires a programming approach. And as I said before, we have some public source code available. Uh, that's what you're looking at here. Uh, the URL I, I gave you before, it's uh, up here in the title bar, uh, bitbucket.org. And uh, this source code is Python, um, and it basically shows you how you can interact with the GridSmart API, and I'm going to demo that in just a second. So if you're not familiar with Python, uh, Python is a, uh, it, it's a programming language. Um, it's very easy to use, very easy to learn, and it's available in just about every system. Uh, in particular, if you're using Python, we recommend uh, also using something called Pandas, which is a library for data analysis that's available with Python. Incredibly powerful. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, you should take a look at it. Um, I think you'll be uh, pleased with what you're able to do with it. If you're looking for a way to get Python uh, onto your computer, uh, we recommend what's known as the Anaconda distribution. Uh, you can directly download for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And uh, we're using uh, Python uh, 2, not Python 3. So with that in mind, quick API demo. I'm going to jump into a notebook here. Uh, now this is explained in the open source repo, uh, how to use this notebook and, and what a Python notebook is. Uh, but I'm going to show you a couple little programming steps uh, that make use of the API. So I'm currently on my intranet. I'm going to add an IP address for a site I can reach. That's one of our demo sites, one of our test sites. Um, and I know the port number we're communicating with that site on is 8902. So with those variables set, I'm going to import uh, the GTI Pi source code. And I'm going to connect to the site. So what I want to point out is when I'd save this notebook, what's available to you, it'll note that I was talking to Kingston Park and North Shore, which is a site we like to demo a lot. Uh, now that I've entered a new IP address uh, and connect to that site, you'll see this is a GS2 at Hardin Valley. Um, so another thing I might want to do is ask a site what days of data it has available. Um, you can actually set a range on this. Uh, without parameters, you can just ask for the full range. Uh, let's ask for the month of June this year. Um, so June 1st through, let's check through yesterday, uh, or let's check 
let's see, through yesterday, June 8th. Uh, and let's see what days are available. And so it's showing me and sending order that all those days are available. So now, if you want, you can actually download those those days and it'll save them to your local file system. Uh, as an example of that, uh, I'm going to do this directly and showing you how the API works. So I'm going to open up a new tab and I'm going to use the same site I was just using in that notebook. So I'm going to enter the API call, API counts by date, and I'm going to grab the counts for yesterday. And when I hit return, notice, see a download. And if I go into my downloads and see what I've got, I've got a counts.zip. Um, so let's see what's inside that zip file. I'll expand it. Uh, it gives me a folder, and inside I see a MAC address, one for each camera. I have an arrivals folder events folder, real-time folder, states folder, um, and let's look inside uh, camera counts folder, expand that, and you'll see for that day, each of these is a CSV file that are the counts for the specific zone. So take a look at what's in there. It's a CSV, as I mentioned. This is all documented. Uh, so again, counts have arrivals, events, real-time data, and states. Uh, arrivals are recording timestamps of when uh, a vehicle arrives in a zone. Uh, states are the timestamps for when a zone transitions between uh, on and off. And as I mentioned, all of this is documented uh, in the public source and the open source repo. Uh, in particular, if you will click on source and doc, you can see the documentation for each of these. So there's arrivals documentation counts documentation, uh, events, uh, explains what's in the events file. So that's how you interact with the API uh, to download count data. Now in fact, I actually use this, um, for, you see the rest of this demo notebook that's available if you download the repository of source code. I use this to interact with Kings Pike and North Shore and download quite a bit of data and we're going to turn our attention to that now. Actually, real quickly before we leave this notebook, uh, scroll down a little bit further, and you'll see some of the more uh, some of the other functionality that's uh, in the open source code, where we're grabbing all uh, lots of data. We can create uh, daily uh, count per line CSVs. We can uh, do some hourly CSVs. So I create all these CSVs. Uh, here's some examples of plotting. So we're looking at hourly volume for a specific week: Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday, Sunday. Um, we can also maybe look, uh, break it down by left turns. Um, so anyway, this sort of shows you the, the power uh, of Python and uh, the GridSmart API. So now let's uh, turn our attention back to the presentation with that demo out of the way. So I mentioned uh, I'd use that notebook um, to download data from Kingston Pike and North Shore. Uh, this is a uh, Google Maps uh, satellite view of Kingston Pike and North Shore. And what I want to do now is think back to those questions we can ask and answer. So with the API and permanent data, we can ask the question, how has traffic changed year over year? So this is, uh, this is what's known as a violin plot um, of uh, the North Shore volumes by day, Monday through Sunday. What we're really looking at here is the, uh, the median uh, volume for the day is the white dot, and these violins, as they're known, uh, show sort of the distribution around, uh, around that time. So you'll see around 42 to 46,000 vehicles per day, um, and this is from 23, October 2013 to March of 2014, six-month period. And since we have data permanently, we can see how things change year over year. So from 2013 to 2014 uh, slash 2015, uh, we actually see uh, about a 2% weekly decrease in traffic. But then in the following year, as you can see those distributions move up, we actually have a 6% weekly increase in traffic. So that's a question you can ask with permanent data and get a nice answer to. Um, another question. Morning rush hour. So if you look at kind of a standard weekly profile uh, of this intersection, I'm showing you uh, these are by hour. So it's plotted by hour. 
uh, across several days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and we're going to look at a few weeks in succession. So we start with this first week, March 12th, and we notice Thursday and Friday have morning peaks, morning rush hours. Um, and then we take a look at the following week. We see that Thursday and Friday, now in green, have no morning peaks. So the question is, what happened to them? Uh, interesting, interestingly, in this uh, this week, you'll also notice that Sunday has a very large uh, noontime church peak. Uh, so this is actually Palm Sunday, high church attendance. Uh, and also, Thursday and Friday were spring break uh, for the schools uh, around the area. So spring break means uh, no school, and it often means uh, many people on vacation with their kids. So you'll see the disappearance of the, of the peaks on Thursday and Friday. Uh, back on Monday, though. Now let's look at the following week. And here we see standard peak in the morning on Thursday, but no such peak on Friday. Well, Friday was a school holiday, not necessarily a work holiday, so the hypothesis here would be that this morning peak is primarily uh, from school traffic. So that might, that might uh, give you some information about how you would want to do uh, construction in the area uh, if you had some planned. Uh, also, take a look here at uh, Easter Sunday where you see uh, a, a very large, uh, again, a very large uh, church peak. Okay, uh, interestingly on this intersection, back in uh, early 2015, uh, they decided to enable permissive lefts uh, on the mainline road. And you can actually see how this affects performance. So what I'm showing here is a plot of the left turn counts for weekdays uh, in the eastbound and westbound directions. And you can see the increase uh, f f uh, over time here in early 2015. Uh, in particular, uh, what we're showing here is that when they enabled permissive lefts, we saw about a, um, an 18% increase in the total left turns, and about 30% of those were purely permissive. So that's another question uh, you can answer with permanent counts. Let's take a, a look at a different intersection. So this uh, intersection, Kings Park and Morrell, is near tons of retail and restaurants. Uh, also just off the interstate, the, the main interstate, I-40 and 75 are combined through Knoxville, Tennessee. So what's the overall peak hour on average? Uh, most of the time when we're doing count studies, we think about doing a midweek count study. Now what I'm showing here are the uh, hourly profiles, averaged over about uh, two and a half years worth of data. And what you notice is the, the overall peak hour on average is actually the green plot, which is Saturday. So Saturday at 1 p.m. is the overall peak near this intersection. And that may be unexpected. Uh, another question, what are the highest volume days of the year at this intersection? Uh, many people, uh, if you're guessing near retail, um, you would think uh, the holiday period around Christmas. So what I've done, and what I'm about to show, and I'll let it scroll by, is grab the peak hours um, over a, over a three, two and a half to three year period. Uh, and see what days they're on. So I want you to take a look at the days. They're going to scroll by on the right. And you'll see see how many times you see Saturday. Um, so that's interesting. So obviously the peak hours are weekends. So midweek count study is not going to tell you anything. Um, but what you may not have noticed is the dates. So I want to go through this again. And this time I want to show you the dates. And I've highlighted a few dates of interest. So what you may notice here is, yeah, you'll see some Christmas time stuff there, but it turns out many of the uh, the highest peak hours uh, near this mall and restaurants are around Valentine's Day. So that was something that might have been unexpected, and uh, it's rarely available with permanent count studies. Another question you might want to ask: um, If we've revitalized downtown or, or uh, built a new center, how has it changed traffic in the area? Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, back in 2014, did a downtown revitalization. Uh, they built uh, the PPL Center, which was a, a new sports and uh, concert venue. At the same time, they also put in uh, 36 grid smart systems uh, and McCain Transparency um, Central System, and they're using the grid smart uh, systems for, for counting. So, how had downtown tra traffic changed? So from October 2014 to March of 2015, we collect data, 
and we can see these profiles and then one year later we see these profiles move up and in fact we see a nine percent weekly increase in traffic and the largest increases uh, were uh, Thursday, uh, Friday, and uh, or the weekend which is, which is nice. So Gritsmart's counted a lot of cars and just as kind of an interesting plot how many cars have have we counted? So we look back through time starting in 2011 to 2016 at the end of 2016 uh, we've counted about almost 17 billion cars uh, surely more than 17 billion at this point. This is kind of an interesting thing to note uh, the number of hours that we've counted um, at the end of 2016 was over 13 million hours and if you were doing that hourly um, at, at the, uh, the optimal rate that I found for hourly count studies you're looking at around 190 million dollars of, of cars being counted. Okay let's turn our attention now to cloud reporting and uh, this is uh, some functionality that's coming soon and I'm excited to tell you about it. So the GridSmart client which you've used for reporting, you know, it provides a limited set of reports. Um, it's nice for single intersection, for looking at a day or two at a time, or setting up auto reports. It's not really for big data sets, though, so it can get unwieldy and slow if you start if you downloaded tons of data um, for many many intersections. It can really start to fill up your disk as well. So one of the things we're going to be doing is uh, enhancing and and making available cloud reporting. So what I'm going to do now is uh, show you a demo of that, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, again, this is coming soon. So let's switch out of the uh, presentation, and I'm going to go to the GridSmart client first, and I want to go to North Shore. And what I want to note here in Kingston Park and North Shore is that uh, I've drawn a few advanced zones. And what you'll notice is, is it's set back from the stop line zone and it's not being used for output but it's being used for counting um, and in fact it's being used for arrivals. So I mentioned those, uh, uh, those arrivals files so each zone has an arrival file but you may want to put your zones as a setback if you really want to try to compute uh, arrivals. And uh, this will work pretty well and you'll notice if I double click the zone and go to the configuration I gave it a nice name which is the phase 8 arrivals and I've done the same thing on uh, all the approaches you can see uh, these uh, arrival zones now sometimes you're a little bit limited with how far you can set those back with the fisheye uh, but it's still a pretty effective approach so with that in mind I'm gonna switch to a pre-release version of GridSmart Cloud. So as I mentioned, now I'm in GridSmart Cloud. Our intersections are pushing data to GridSmart Cloud. I'm on the Kingston Pike and North Shore intersection that I was just showing you. And let's look at the data tab. So as I mentioned, this is pre-release. This isn't the final UI, uh, but I want to show you how it works. So the first thing we're going to enable as a cloud-based report is a Purdue coordination diagram. Uh, so how do, how do they work? All right, well, I'm going to select my day. I'm going to select Wednesday, midweek. Select the time. This is probably pretty familiar if you've used the client. So I'm going to use 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. I'm going to use phase four. Uh, now this is a TS1 intersection, so you, you need to tell it how, how long the yellow is because we're measuring the greens. Uh, four seconds of yellow here. And remember how I named some zones to, uh, to be the arrival zones. So I'm going to select the phase four arrivals and I'm going to generate the Purdue coordination diagram. So this is all being done cloud side. And what we have is a Purdue coordination diagram. So you can see your arrivals. Now this is not actually a coordinated uh, intersection, but uh, you can get the effect. So for example, here around noon, you can see kind of a cluster of, uh, of late arrivals um, that are arriving just after the start of red. Now another thing we're, we're experimenting with is different ways to visualize the data. Um, so you'll notice down here at the bottom I also have something called the GridSmart PCD or the GridSmart Purdue Coordination Diagram. And I'm going to generate that. Uh, the little note tells you here what, what we've done with this is, is just change the display a little bit so you can actually readily see um, 
how much time uh, was allotted to red and how much time was allotted to green. So here you can obviously see the cycle links very clearly and you can see the, the, uh, the transitions between different plans. Uh, if I'm generate the GridSmart PCD, uh, the view is a little different. You can't quite see the cycle links, but then you can see exactly, based on the zero line, how long the, the uh, green was and then how long the red was. and gives you an idea of, of what people are experiencing in the intersection. So uh, that's the first introduction um, to what you're going to be seeing um, with cloud-based reporting, and you should be seeing that made available in the next several weeks, and uh, you should expect to see uh, some enhancements and uh, to cloud data and cloud reporting. So I really appreciate your time today. Hopefully uh, you found this helpful and I look forward to uh, questions and feedback. Thank you very much.